stunned. Um, in the process of doing one of these uh, traveling road shows, uh, and I'm in the midst of that at the moment, I hope that doesn't sound pompous, it's just a fact. And you go through this process that is the lecture over and over again. Uh, and as you hear it coming out of your mouth, uh, it, starts to, it starts to sound a little uh, a predictable um, and a little disingenuous after a while. The first one is usually okay. Uh, this is the second one. So what I'll, what I'll try to do is, in a way, to reinvent it. Uh, that what I'm talking about, of course, has no meaning to you, since you didn't hear the first one. Uh, but it has some meaning to me, and I just wanted to be able to communicate in a felt way, or an experiential way, uh, what interests me and uh, what my efforts uh, are about. Uh, in, in the process of saying it's this, but it's that, or which truth do you want to tell, and there are many truths and all of that, there's also something finally a little bit disingenuous about that, I think, because I, I start to feel like I'm trying to give the impression that I really don't know what the hell I'm talking about, or I have no idea what I'm doing, or it could be anything, and in fact, it's, it's a kind of disarming tactic. Politicians use it frequently. Uh, on both sides of every ocean. Uh, and I don't quite mean that. I mean, I think there, there are clearly some things that, that I've begun to understand. I think more and more I know at least what I won't do if I'm not quite sure what I will do. Uh, in any event, uh, the lights uh, go down in this establishment. A couple of intentions in the first uh, pair of slides. Uh, on your right is a building called the Caracol, uh, which you haven't uh, been exposed to in Charles Jenks's history class uh, at the AA, uh, or probably in any other. I think one of the reasons I started to get interested in this stuff or, or these kinds of things is I was trying to find a way out of uh, the conventional chronology of architectural education that in one way or another uh, we're all fed and finally come to realize that there are all sorts of ways of understanding or looking at the process of building and the history of building and what ingredients you can feed on or learn from are, are very frequently not the ones uh, or at least not in the form that you, they're usually given that finally are, are helpful to you. And I think part of, part of this process, and it, it may be tougher for people at the AA, which, which generally has some reasonable practitioners handing this stuff out, is that the, the better the instructors, the longer it will take you to unlearn whatever they've told you. So you can figure out for yourself what actually is, is germane. And in attempting to do that, I wandered into the Yucatan uh, several years ago, which is in the eastern portion of Mexico, and uh, stumbled onto this building in a place called Chichen Itza. Uh, and the, the work which is done in that part of the world is a work of a very different sensibility. It's actually ferocious, aggressive stuff, and, and not analytical and intellectual, at least not in the way I think we understand those terms, in a Western way. And I think that sensibility uh, combined with others is one that, that interests me a lot. And uh, I'd, I'd like to be able to learn how to incorporate it into the work that I do. Although, again, the act of being conscious of it may, may mean that finally you can't build it in, because a lot of that kind of work in, in a part of the world where it grew separately and disconnected from other parts in the world is in a certain sense not so conscious of itself, or not so conscious of itself as a way of working as opposed to other ways of working. We're in a different situation because we probably know too much about too many things. Uh, in any event, in case you don't recognize it, that's Venus on your left. Uh, and the building, the Caracol, was apparently designed, and no one is quite sure why, to trace 
the movement of the morning star in the sky as it, as it moves uh, from place to place. And the reason I, I, I'm interested in that connection is because that's, there seems to have been a kind of collective agreement or a societal agreement that a major building in a major city ought to have this particular role. It was understood, it was agreed on, and all of that. And that quality, I think, in, in our world, or anyway in the world that I've come to know, is almost entirely absent. And therefore, to, to look in an extroverted way, or to look for external sources for buildings, to look for a kind of public consensus about what a building might mean or what it might do, uh, is, is, I think, very difficult to do at this point in time. Uh, this shouldn't be another round of street corner nihilism or anything like that. I don't, I don't intend that as a consequence of my previous statement. But I think, I think one, one has to look in a more introverted way now, or in a more personal way, because in the end, I think that's all that we have uh, to rely on. And uh, one of the reasons, and I think our, our culture, or lack of culture, or confusion, or whatever uh, one might label it, is very conscious of the process of time eating everything. The Mayans may not have had that problem because they saw whatever they did running in perpetuity with a certain meaning across time. I think we don't feel that, we feel the opposite. Uh, the two uh, instances, one uh, on your right, uh, Mies at IIT, uh, in a way that probably he didn't expect uh, to be seen. <laughs> notwithstanding Augustine and Plato and, and uh, Aquinas and other associations that are often made uh, with respect to his kind of perpetual purity, with time e eating that as well. And on the other side of the world, whatever is left uh, of Cambodia in Angkor Wat, and if you have a chance to get into that place, it's not a bad place to go, but also that civilization from a very different vantage point, but hard to imagine those people building that project over many years and seeing it now finally devoured by, by the world that in a certain sense it came to, it was supposed to represent and dominate. So I think what I'm saying is in, in a world where, where you're so sensitive to time passing and time eating everything, it's very difficult to be didactic. I think it's tough to pontificate, notwithstanding the fact that I'm sure a number of people stand up here every week and do all of those things, and I'll probably do the same. So you should, since you're English, or at least a few of you, uh, you should be skeptical. Uh, and so skepticism in that sense is, is uh, probably a, a virtue. Uh, these, this pair, a uh, couple of things, the one on your right is not meant to suggest uh, an architectural ideal or aspiration, but a kind of extreme, if there is such a thing now as an extreme, which means in my mind that almost anything we want to invent is possible or plausible or conceivable. That doesn't mean it convinces anyone. That's a separate problem. But the range is, the range is almost infinite now. Almost everything is possible. On the left, uh, a remodeled uh, version of the famous drawing in creation is a patient search, remodeled because uh, I rotated at 90 degrees with Apollo on the top and Dionysus on the bottom. And this is a personal feeling, maybe you share it, maybe you don't, but what, what I wanted to represent, and in fact, it would have been better to Xerox reduce Apollo down to one-tenth of that size while leaving Dionysus as is, because I started to very much feel that what is rational or analytical or what generally passes for Apollonian is an anomaly, really. It's a blip floating in a kind of Dionysian sea. So to, to think that the world is amenable to a kind of rational construct for me is, is an impossible proposition, or a difficult proposition, at least today. Uh, on, on the left, the ubiquitous uh, machine, which 
uh, creeps into the work uh, from, from time to time uh, in one way or another, um, not, in a, not in an idolatrous way, not as Hong Kong Bank, Lloyd's, any of that, not in adulation, uh, the kind of, maybe the kind of 19th century machine which hasn't quite been perfected, doesn't always work, breaks down a little bit, is a little bit greasy and dirty and all of that, but is still in addition to the lexicon of beauty or the language of the world that we've come to know. And as that, uh, in that position, seems to have some role and some influence. Uh, in the world and to some extent in, in the work that I've done in the last few years. Uh, the, the, the scale is, I guess at one level, a sort of cartoon. Uh, in another sense, it's, it's about this analytical question or the interest in quantity and in measure and in dimension. And those, those qualities are all important. It's hard to put certain things down without dimensions, and yet it turns out, at least in a metaphorical sense, that sometimes the scale has to break or it has to be bent in order to do uh, certain kinds of work. On the right uh, is the Issei Shrine, which some of you uh, may know. It's a Taoist shrine. It goes back to the seventh uh, century uh, in Japan. And embodies, in a literal sense, uh, one of the qualities that I think is, is uh, for me, important to try to interject into the life or the sensibility of a building. The way it works, uh, briefly, is that there are two contiguous sites. And the building is built, and it has a life of 20 years, and then it's taken down, and then it's rebuilt identically on the next site. And that process goes on, uh, apparently, uh, in perpetuity and has done uh, since, uh, since the seventh century. So the building is part of a tradition. It's constant, it's regular, it's predictable. And simultaneously, it's always changing. It's fresh, it's new, it's vital. And it has both of those qualities. And I think, I think of course, they're cheating because the building is finally kinetic. But it embodies, it embodies this quality both of, of stasis and of movement, which I, th which I think uh, are, are essential qualities in life and transposed, if possible, into buildings. Um, drawing on your left is, goes back about uh, 4,000 years, so they didn't draw it in vain, maybe. Uh, it's a Babylonian map of the sky. And I think it's, as, as long as you have one of these, I think, ahead, or at least nominally ahead, uh, one is again inclined to try to map, to draw, to understand, in order to predict. Because I think to know, in this case, to know the sky probably meant to know what the hell was likely to happen to you on Earth, what had happened and conceivably would allow you to go forward the next day, knowing that tomorrow would be somewhat like today. But I think our experience, the map, of course, turns out to be not quite correct, uh, which is not surprising. Nor is it surprising that our maps of the same sky also turn out, finally, to be not correct. So again, this I don't know whether, whether you're persuaded by that. I'm not sure I'm trying to persuade anybody. But you always get the feeling that what's known is only known until something else is known. So that everything is tentative and hypothetical. Uh, and will be replaced by something else, and it goes on uh, in perpetuity. There's probably another, another side to that goes on in perpetuity discussion, which is that it goes to some place, or it's directional. And uh, there's, there are a few philosophers, I think Toynbee is one, maybe Augustine is one, that, that see uh, historic events finally resolved in a kind of religious apocalypse or something of that nature. And I think in some way, in the process of doing these buildings, I don't want to argue that they're open-ended. I'd, like I'd like to say that they both leave a number of possibilities open, 
but also posit the prospect of a kind of resolution somewhere so that it can't just be anything, anytime, any way, and that'll all change tomorrow. So I think I'm trying to have it uh, both ways, and we'll have to find out whether uh, that prospect is realizable or not. These are a couple of old projects. One is in Tokyo, the other is in San Diego. But again, the sort of uh, the, the impetus to a kind of intellectualization and uh, map making uh, these two uh, being uh, further developments uh, of the previous two. One is the country club, the other uh, is an opera house. And there, there is a sense somehow that, and particularly it may not be true here any longer, but the last time I was here, the, the issue of the meaning of this analysis or the intellectual side of, 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 of things, the documentation of things, as opposed to the experience and, and, and what finally is realized. Uh, and and it, it may be, and it, this, is, this is open for question, that, that the process of intellectualizing and analyzing and drawings actually it has a meaning quite separate from the meaning in the building, which might be emotive first and intellectual second, notwithstanding a kind of attempt to intellectualize in the drawings. Uh, this is a project done about four years ago uh, in Los Angeles the essential piece of which uh, is a tower uh, described there on the right. And the tower involves, I guess you guys don't have one of those pointers, but uh, the tower involves the, the piece sort of in the center slightly to the right. The plan uh, involves the interrelationship of a building which actually passes through the tower. It's a wall system. And then the legs of the tower, which are uh, owe something to Rene Descartes, and are uh, at least uh, uh, allegedly related to a surrounding street system. Uh, and then a roof, which is which is turned, uh, and does something again somewhat different. The roof is is a conventional pyramidal roof, but the turning of it and uh, in association. Uh, with actually a freeway uh, somewhat in the distance actually both separates it but in another way joins it uh, to the legs of the building which, which have a slightly different reference. Again, this, this business about which truth do you want to tell and, and that statement was originally which lie do you want to tell but uh, the editor at Rizzoli uh, <laughs> whose intention is to sort of clean it up a little uh, unfortunately I think uh, modified it a, a bit. And I think the reason that I say that is that a lot of these things are in the end very narcissistic. I mean, they're very much about themselves, although they can pretend, for instance, like the, the old Dusseldorf rotated piece that Sterling used to talk about and say, yeah, it's rotated to the intersection seven miles away or something, as if that kind of association in an urban sense legitimatized or legitimized that move. And the same rhetoric is, is now being heard again with the roof. And yet I think really the interest is the making of the tower. And some of these uh, manipulations are very much about that making, regardless if there's some uh, freeway in the distance or not. Now looking at the uh, back of the building uh, on the left, which is actually, uh, this, is, this is in some sense programmatic, I guess, whatever that might mean to you, but it, it's used by uh, two different tenants uh, in the tower and assorted other paraphernalia uh, on the right. And then uh, a series of, of studies of the tower. Again, the, uh, you can see the wall, or maybe you can see the wall of the building shell that passes through the tower as well, there's the, the tower is, is not, or the tower roof is not a roof. It's opened up uh, so that it rains into the building. And there's a glass piece you can see there on the uh, slide on the right, which is an extension of a metal roof uh, beyond, which slides through the tower and actually it catches the rain when it rains, or catches some of the rain, anyway. Uh, on, on the left, uh, this, this may be back to the discussion of, of the machine. 
there, there's a phrase that I've used, borrowed from uh, Thomas Wolfe that Stan mentioned, uh, the beauty of the railroad. And this is not Madison Avenue's Thomas Wolfe. This is a look homeward angel of Thomas Wolfe, in case there's uh, a confusion. But it's a guy from North Carolina who, who wrote some novels that you know and came to New York and looking around made a comment about, about this, what I called an addition to the lexicon of beauty and he referred to it as the beauty of the railroad car in a, in a kind of literal way, but in a suggestive or figurative way. So this may be an interest in the, in the sort of erogenous uh, railroad car there on the left. Uh, looking up into the tower on the right, and these various mechanisms, legible and sometimes not quite so legible at work, the mechanism of the roof, the roof, by the way, clipped off except on the street side so that it defers to the wall and to the order of the tower on three sides but then hangs out on, on the street front. So its system and the leg system and the wall system sailing. You want me to back it up? I think it's, yeah, thanks. So looking uh, two directions, uh, this place has subsequently been uh, filled up uh, by a number of alleged graphic designers. <laughs> so this, this is, a, uh, for me, a little bit different. It's, I don't want to call it a sedative. Uh, but it's, it's uh, Christy, I don't know what the word for it ought to be. Anyway, the, the building is essentially an introverted building with this court and a glass uh, roll-up door. Uh, and Very quick. Now we're on to the next uh, building somehow. This building is adjacent to the first one, one stop to the south. And it's an existing building of about 35, 40,000 square feet. It's a concrete frame, uh, which I originally uh, wanted to knock down in sort of conventionally aggressive fashion. And after a number of debates uh, with the owner and the city authorities, uh, it was determined that that was not the way to proceed. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that, but in any event, this hypothesis followed. Uh, there, there actually is an inset section, it's a vault, uh, as, as you see uh, illustrated here. But the vault is turned in a way so that its, its lines, its edges, are not parallel uh, to the original uh, uh, geometries, uh, which are rectilinear uh, of the original building, but in fact does something which is not dissimilar from the pyramidal roof in the previous building. And what that means is, is that the edge of the vault is actually parabolic and is rising to the street front where one <coughs> encounters it uh, entering uh, through the lobby. This is on the left looking at it from the back and on, on the right looking at it from the north. The entry side of the street is the far piece of the far slide. And it actually breaks down internally to some extent relative to, to some programmatic issues. The front piece is a lobby, uh, the central piece is, a, is an enormous bridge and a lounge area, and the back piece turns out to be uh, an access uh, stairway. And it's, it has a kind of theoretical existence. It comes to some extent from the circle or from the cylinder, so that in fact this might run on in perpetuity, and out of that per library of perpetuity, these volumes are pulled out that fit the particular program. So in fact, the line there, slide on the left, the parabolic line runs in a constant form, but these pieces are just selected out. And looking on the right uh, at, at the tower piece there, center left, and uh, this so-called Paramount Laundry Building, it, that was its original name. It's across the street from an enormous uh, movie-making uh, complex and the entry, a canopy, uh, with this uh, displaced column on the left. 
again, the, the uh, entry canopy, there's uh, some uh, discussion of the meaning of the column. Uh, and again, this is which lie will you swallow? Or which one do you want to tell? It, it comes out of a vocabulary, that is to say, these are, these are vitrified clay pipes. They're a sort of catalog item, although their use is not usually this. And uh, there, there are components that allow one to go around corners and so on. So these are, in fact, uh, components that, that are part of the lexicon or part of the language of that uh, particular system. It also, uh, the, that column occurs at the point uh, where one enters uh, the site, this being a sort of uh, typical Los Angeles quadrangle, which means it's a parking lot. So as one drives into that parking lot, goes by that column, column uh, and uh, canopy you see here in detail. And I thought I had another slide. Maybe it's coming up. And so I come back to the, to the parking lot question and the role of the column. Anyway, this is the entry lobby, which is a double helix under that first <coughs> chunk of the vault, which is up above. And one enters and goes to the third floor stair on the right. And then just behind, you see that little piece of railing on the left. One goes up to the second floor. And then looking into the area under the second piece of vault uh, on the left, uh, it's eccentric. Uh, I don't mean figuratively, but literally, it may be both. But there are three columns on this side, two on the other side. And the missing column is a sort of proscenium area, which has to do actually uh, with the way that people are supposed to behave in that space. Slide on the right is the upper level lobby uh, before you go into the third floor looking out. So this is uh, now the, uh, the central piece uh, under the vault, which is a bridge that connects two, section, uh, two sections of uh, third floor. Uh, original trusses, uh, the bottom cords have been cut and amended with a number of steel pieces in order to make the clearance, among other reasons, and to get across the bridge. And there's a lounge area in the center. So on the left, uh, the, the five uh, column system with this proscenium in the middle. On the right, the bridge from the underside uh, which involves both the orders of the original building and the street, and the white pieces there, uh, which are perpendicular to the axis of the vault, which is not parallel to the edge of the building. Those pieces go on up and hold uh, the vault at the roof. And looking on the left is, is the back of that central area bench, part of the bridge. And uh, looking down the bridge uh, on the left, and that split axonometric drawing, the mechanism of the bridge and that uh, bench uh, shown there. Uh, this is on the left uh, what is euphemistically known as the Joe Curley Memorial Award. Uh, Joe Curley was the uh, structural engineer uh, who survived uh, this project. Uh, and just in case he didn't, there was an electric chair uh, designed uh, to accommodate him. Uh, this is a project at the University of California uh, at Irvine, uh, which, which is uh, the site of a number of uh, somewhat uh, interesting and rather small buildings sponsored by an unusual guy by the name of, of David Newman. Uh, who has since, unfortunately, fled uh, to Palo Alto, to Stanford uh, University. Uh, this is an office building uh, which is situated on a corner site uh, at a critical entrance to the campus, uh, but very far away from most of the campus buildings. And the campus plan, such as it is, is essentially a radial plan, concentric uh, circles, and connecting paths of, of automobiles and pedestrians and, and not particularly prosaic. Uh, and at the edge, it works its way back to something which is a little more orthogonal. And this project is, occurs uh, at that edge. 
the, the format or the mechanism started uh, with the positioning of, of an ellipse on the site. The site is sloping up high at the top, slide on the left to bottom, so it slopes from west uh, to east. So the figure of the ellipse is actually not literally an ellipse because it's bent and folded uh, across uh, the face of the, of the hill. I think this, the, the need to, to impose something like that as part of the master plan of the project, aside from uh, sort of general inclinations of megalomania, had to do with the fact that, that a lot of the buildings on the campus finally start to bump into each other. Things are added and subtracted and so on. So there was built in here a mechanism to control as, as much as was possible uh, the building and beyond the building uh, to the streets on the perimeter. Uh, the axis of the ellipse uh, runs back uh, roughly towards uh, the center of the campus, although whether, uh, whether that represents a prosaic a reference or whether it's more about this kind of narcissism of, of the making of the building, somebody else should say, probably some of both. Uh, but in any event, it, it forms a ridge, uh, an apex, which divides a shed roof to the left and to the right and the slide on the right. They're actually, uh, the, the entrance to the building is, is uh, there on the right. It's, it's up an enormous ramp. And the building contains two, or is it one? I'm not, you might check the numerology there, senor. I'm, I'm not sure that, are they right? Anyway, the building contains two uh, programmatic pieces. Uh, one, uh, a number of private offices, uh, and two, more public or public-oriented spaces. And the definitions of those, okay, the definitions of those uh, are related to these two roof structures. One, the roof uh, whose line is the axis, central axis of the ellipse, and the other is another imposition of a building roof that, uh, somewhat like the Paramount Laundry Project, that, that has, except that this one has a finite existence, I think of the other one as more of an infinite existence, which, which occurs and then disappears at uh, key junction points, lobbies and gathering points, lounges and so on, uh, over uh, the course of the building. The two, uh, the two roof systems uh, have reference to, to uh, issues of the surface of the land. The site is sloping at about 10% uh, from the right side of the slide to the left. The floors of the building follow that slope. And then the roof, the piecemeal roof, is essentially coincident, which is to say the hip or the, or the uh, edge of that roof is sloping down and essentially acknowledges the site while the line of, of uh, the other roof, the shed, uh, is parallel to the world or parallel to the world as, as flat, uh, which runs uh, in opposition uh, to the sloping roof. One of the discussions in this project with the, uh, with the occupants or with the prospective occupants actually had to do with an interest in a building which, which would never qualify as an institutional building. And there was some interest in, in developing spaces that were personalized and all of that. And the way the building works, not in plan, where that issue is almost non-existent, but in section, because of the development of the building in section, uh, each space actually, it turns out, is, is uh, peculiar and private and different. And strangely enough, they uh, seem uh, to, to celebrate that and, and be quite happy uh, with it. The, the issue of, of uh, the, the roof is uh, shown here in both slides. Uh, you can see on the slide on the left the line of, of the ridge of the roof, which is horizontal. But because, it, because of the position of the ellipse rotated in plan, the edge of that roof as it meets the building rises so that the line, so that the edge of the roof 
which is parallel to a flat world actually rises to a point over that uh, window there, which is also uh, a particularly significant area in the building. So from the flat roof, the edge uh, rises and then uh, descends. And then behind that, you can see the other roof, which first jumps up and then goes sailing back down. And finally, in all of this discussion, it probably is not so clear uh, which lines belong to who or whether straight lines engender sloping lines or any of that, or finally, what is horizontal and what is not. So there, there, there's, I think, intentionally, again, some discussion about what's what, but underneath there actually is a kind of rational exegesis which is available in case anybody has the time to listen to all of that rhetoric. The window on the right actually opens into a room where uh, new students, freshmen, uh, are welcomed uh, to the campus as a part of uh, the orientation process. On the left uh, is the entry lobby. Uh, this is another uh, building in that group uh, of two that we've looked at. Uh, this, is, this is the third. And one uh, usually sees this building. You see a slide on the right the tilted wall, and one typically sees that wall on end, that is slide on the left or slide on the right. So the building is not approached frontally. It can be, but is usually not. The street runs this way, one way. So one sees it on end, so the slope of the wall has a particular meaning as a consequence of that. Uh, the plan is, is uh, so one enters from the bottom slide on the left or secondarily from the street. Uh, also a slide on the left. The front section uh, is a grouping of offices and small courtyards uh, around a fountain. The roof system of that is a double gabled cruciform roof, the center of which crosses uh, the fountain. And that roof form then influences in section uh, the ceilings of offices around the perimeter. So it, it provides a kind of organizational order in the section, although that roof is never visible unless you're very high up on a roof of another building adjacent. And on the right, uh, some drawings of, of the uh, street front of the building. That frame, uh, by the way, uh, that steel frame actually uh, well has, has a couple of functions. One is to keep the masonry above uh, from joining the masonry down below. So it apparently does something structural. Uh, and in case you want to know what time it is, there is a clock uh, sitting in the center of that, uh, of that piece. You can see it, although not so clearly, uh, slide on the left. I think there's, there's an interest in all of, of, of these projects in some wise or other in the process of support and structure and gravity uh, and all of that, again, I think trying to unlearn lessons that were handed to me as dictums uh, when, when uh, I was a student. Uh, so there, the, the business of, uh, again, what's, what's supporting who or what's vertical or what's horizontal is, I think, very much part of the process. The, the tilting wall is supported by that chunk of concrete uh, and, as well, is held up uh, with three uh, steel braces or C's that then disappear into the wall behind where they're welded uh, to three uh, steel tubes. Uh, on the right, the, you can see the end or the bottom end of two of those steel braces which come through the wall and are actually folded uh, to make the sign of, of this uh, advertising agency uh, which uh, inhabits uh, the building. The stair, by the way, or the ladder, uh, I find this occurring in, in several projects, and I don't know if it's the impetus to get up and get out or to get away or whatever it is, but it, it nominally is for the local gardener to get up on the top of the wall and, and provide uh, agua uh, for the plants uh, that were prescribed by the local uh, authorities as, as part of the approval process for this project. 
Uh, I don't know whether anybody would would uh, believe that, but anyway, it's 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 a it's an opportunity to get up for one person and to get away. Uh, so if uh, nobody uh, nobody else goes up there, you and I can. Uh, well, at least I can. So this is this is the frame again. Uh, again, the issue of support to the concrete, which is supporting the leaning wall, the higher piece of the wall, which is which is held up on the frame. See the back of the wall there on the left, and on the right with those uh, steel uh, braces. Um, this is a tough one, actually. Again, I think I think it has, uh, for me, a number of readings. The easy ones have to do with, well, there's a window. We know what that is. Uh, the red masonry pieces actually hold plants, and the plants, which, in fact, uh, it does, and are now growing and are growing up those ladders, uh, which were conveniently provided uh, for the plants uh, to make their way up the wall. Uh, and then those are chains and wheels and uh, pieces of acrylic. And uh, next time we'll talk about what they mean, maybe. Um, this, this is on the right. Uh, there was an obligatory uh, roof access piece. Uh, so among other things, that constitutes a ladder. Uh, which gets you from the ground to the roof and actually from one building uh, to an adjacent building. Then inside, uh, remember I, I referred to the first piece of the building as a courtyard. Uh, this is the fountain uh, with uh, the center being the center of this uh, cruciform roof. On the right uh, is the entry lobby. So if you come in, slide on the right, and beyond you, you see the fountain. And now the fountain here, the water actually uh, comes uh, through those uh, heads <coughs> and falls uh, through the marble. And there are roll-up glass doors in that court. Uh, so about 5 o'clock, when everything else there is getting tedious, uh, the people who work there they have a few beers and kind of sit with their feet in the pool. Uh, the, the slide, but they can't quite get to the point of the slide on the right, which I see as, as a Los Angeles version of a Mandela, because at that point, and that's the balance point uh, of the roof system uh, or systems, but you can't ever see that unless you're prepared to stick your head underwater amongst a number of pipes. So it's there, uh, but except for the photographer, you'll never quite get to it. Meanwhile, in the back section of the building, uh, two floors of, of design and drawing and model making and poster making and all of that uh, space uh, with these two uh, skylights above, uh, shown there on the left, uh, skylight, and on the right, the stair uh, on which one approaches it. And uh, there's there's a conference room, there's, there's a normal conference room in the building, a more conventional room. Uh, this room is, is adjacent, small conference room, and is adjacent to the head guy's uh, office. And the argument was made that in, in the, the uh, difficult days of peddling advertising, that if he wanted to move out of his office into some place where his, whatever his conceptions are, had to be jarred or adjusted, that, that this might provide an opportunity for that. So this, this room was done uh, adjacent to his office. It actually, I, I think, I'm, I'm satisfied that it, that it takes on a number of things and that they've actually been resolved to some degree. The room and plan is a square. Uh, the masonry walls uh, follow that square. Then there are a series of legs, the steel feet you see, uh, uh, in front of you, and they they occur in a pattern which, in plan, uh, is eight-sided, and uh, those legs or columns go up and hold the steel can uh, above. As they go up, they're stabilized. That can is essentially conical, and it's stabilized with the steel pieces that you see. I think fairly clearly a slide on the right. 
which is eight-sided on the outside and, and circular, as is the cone on the inside, and joins uh, at four points uh, the walls uh, on the perimeter. Uh, the wood pieces uh, uh, that you see, I think, more clearly on the left are, are aligned with the octagonal system and then tilt and are resolved uh, at the wall. And you can see there, in, in, in that case, in the corner where it moves uh, to a point. On the left, uh, looking, uh, looking down on the table, which actually falls uh, beneath the skylight. And then on the right, uh, kind of a whole series of, of systems, including uh, a, a beam that resolves uh, and supports a glass pyramid, which intervenes between the legs and the cone on a line which is not part of any of the geometry called the line of the perverse which I think is from Edgar Allan Poe, but maybe not. Uh, and, uh, but maybe it should be. Uh, and from, from the outside, you can read on the right, again, the legs, uh, the rings, and then the cut and the cone, uh, which is a skylight, and then this uh, pyramidal uh, resolution between the square and the cone, that glass pyramid uh, shown in both slides. Uh, this, is, this is a project that we've been working on for about a year and a half and finally uh, managed to uh, finagle it through uh, the fire department in the city of Los Angeles. The first phase, at least, which is shown on the right, is a building about 110 meters in length, uh, lifted up on legs over two existing uh, buildings uh, in a light industrial area, if you know Los Angeles, in a kind of central uh, La Cienega uh, area. So this, this project uh, is about to begin construction. It's approached a uh, slide on the right uh, along a road that runs parallel to the front of the building. The road then turns in and runs underneath <laughs> the building and that, that uh, road access or truck access under the building, two buildings at grade on the perimeter of the new building uh, had to be uh, sustained and maintained. Uh, there are two, uh, essentially the envelope of the building is determined by height limits and fire width limits and clearances underneath uh, for trucks and automobiles so that the interventions in what otherwise is essentially a linear block are cut into that block and they involve stairs and pools and courts which in a programmatic sense, if that's important, allow the inhabitants of the building to get out to walk around on the roof and in these other areas without having to go down and intermingle with uh, uh, the business of, of uh, light industry <coughs> down below. Now the legs of the building are actually determined in relationship, maybe you can pick up some of that here quickly, in relationship to an existing series of openings uh, in the buildings at grade. So the system which appears uh, uh, irregularly is in fact logical if one accepts the premise that w one shouldn't block the doors of the existing building, which is uh, mostly uh, the way the building had to work. Uh, these are two studies of, of the two court areas, both involve stairs. Uh, the one on the right is uh, related uh, to the entry uh, there are courts on two levels, and the one on the left involves stairs circulating or circling around uh, what is a pool in a small court, and one can enter that from a number of levels and go up to the roof and so on. Uh, the building on the right is, is an unusual building for, for uh, buildings on the rim of the Pacific Ocean, either rim, because there are no shear walls. Uh, it's all a series of uh, rigid frames, uh, and that's uh, documented in, in that slide on the right. And the model on the left, and then the process of, of going truck entering, going under the building, uh, coming out. And essentially, uh, uh, four uh, critical pieces or four exceptions uh, to the otherwise linearity of the building, the entry piece, then uh, going from right to left, 
and then an area which is, involves lounge and bathrooms and all of that, and then that uh, pentagonal uh, pool and court, and then finally the piece on the back, which is a, a double height piece, uh, which is a major conference room and meeting area. That's on the left, uh, the pool and a bridge across the pool, and then again on the right, uh, the entrance. And this is uh, a study on the right looking up into this uh, lounge uh, gathering area, which is a two to three story space in the midst of the building. <coughs> And getting into phase two, which we've just started to work on, you see a uh, slide on the left, on the sort of mid-right, the end of the long building uh, and the conjunction with this uh, kind of hook. And then the slide on the right, uh, bottom left, the long building, and again, uh, the hook piece, uh, which we're just starting to work on. Uh, this is a project that, that operates at, at several scales, uh, and I'll, I'll go through them uh, one by one, but very briefly. Uh, the first is uh, a very large piece, kind of uh, straight and then curve and straight and then curve. It starts at something called the L.A. River, uh, which is a sort of concrete uh, canal, which doesn't do much. I think is there in anticipation that there might be some flood, uh, but uh, they may be waiting for NOAA. Uh, there's mostly nothing in it, uh, and there are various proposals now that it be a walking area, that it be turned into roads, and some of those uh, proposals are interesting, and in fact something may happen, astonishingly enough. Uh, but in any event, this project starts from that conjunction, which is, which is on the right, and then follows an abandoned railway right-of-way and does various uh, uh, things along that path, finally working its way to a major north-south street in a commercial center uh, called National Boulevard. Uh, so that's step one of the project. And this is, this is, I hope, not another one of these sort of adventures that goes nowhere except into somebody's magazine. We're actually presenting this to a city council and the developer is, is a guy who is, who is in fact known to build uh, what he's asked uh, be studied. So the anticipation is that, that this will get built or get built uh, in large pieces. And in fact, we've talked about pulling uh, several other architects, uh, people uh, who are friends and who might contribute uh, to it uh, into the project. So it, it looks uh, like a promising opportunity Secondly is uh, the white line uh, outlined the slide on the left. The bottom section, which is essentially a rectangle, which is a new piece involving uh, shops and parking and the Mark Taper Theater and, and a whole series uh, of people, which has uh, just begun uh, to be worked on and the program is evolving as, as, as uh, the design studies are evolving. And above that, a uh, piece of about 60,000 square feet uh, of uh, revised, remodeled, restored, reconstituted uh, building, which has uh, just recently been completed. Uh, we're starting to uh, fool around with the uh, ubiquitous computer a little bit, but I, these were really done as, as suggestive in order to terrorize the uh, uh, local gentry and the city fathers uh, when we present uh, this uh, large-scale project, which we're getting ready to do. So I don't want to account for all of this stuff, uh, literally. Uh, and then this, which is a series of model studies on the new section, again, involving office, and on the right, a bridge actually connecting a completed piece to a proposed uh, new piece. And the, uh, the piece here, which uh, has just recently been completed, this is this uh, 60,000 square foot uh, chunk, which is uh, entered uh, there on the right. Uh, it's essentially an L-shaped uh, plan, 
uh, moving from, if you, if you follow in the, in the drawing on the left, moving from that elliptical piece up to a gathering area and then left to a conference area at the end, and then a variety of, of office uh, and light industrial spaces along the way. So this is the plan of that, again, it's inverted from the last slide, but from the entry down to uh, this intermediate point and then left to the back uh, conference room. Uh, this is uh, the entry area here. You're looking both in and out on the left. Uh, this was cut from an existing series of shed buildings that go back to the 1920s, <coughs> which in Los Angeles is an enormous uh, pedigree. So that, uh, that uh, column in the center and the truss work and so on was, was originally supporting uh, a roof which is no longer with us. And then that intervening uh, entry area, which is uh, a quasi-ellipse, quasi at least in plan, built out of rectilinear elements, which behave differently, of course, as, as uh, the shape of the ellipse changes in the course of its length. So as it tightens up over around the ends or around the door, the blocks protrude differently uh, than uh, when the blocks uh, occur in the, in the uh, long faces uh, of the ellipse. On the right, looking up at the canopy over the entrance, and then now uh, inside, looking back uh, at the block, and at the door, and then one follows this nave uh, on, that's spelled with a K, uh, follows it down to this intermediate area, and then left uh, to uh, the conference room. The wall system is actually made of, of uh, three different pieces, or has at least three strategies. Uh, there's an, an orthogonal piece, you can see there on the left, which is, which is uh, the drywall piece. It's a series of frames and supports that occur regularly. Uh, the frame or the height of that opening is a constant height uh, <coughs> in the building. The top wall is the wall that separates the nave from the internal or tenant space, and that height varies as the building varies. Uh, behind that is this uh, wall made up of these arched pieces. And that goes up and down, or the arch rises and falls as the floor rises and falls, which it does uh, over the course of, of uh, one's movements through the building. So that varies, and the arch varies, uh, whereas uh, on the outside, whereas on the inside, the top of the arch wall, which is a slide on the right, stays constant. So you got all that. Uh, behind that is the glass wall. Which, which finalizes the separation between public movement and the tenant, and that's tacked to the back of the arch wall. That's the central uh, lobby area on the left. This is the first tenant, uh, which is uh, a computer a company. There are offices and there's some assembly areas as well with offices in LA and, and in Stuttgart. And then this is the uh, central lobby area behind which is a consumer research uh, company outside on, on the right, inside on the left. And actually there's a shot down that entry hallway which runs back to this piece uh, on the left which is in case you don't recognize it uh, from Tom Beebe's rendition, is a library. Uh, it was actually recently uh, characterized by an American architect or a New York architect as a typical Los Angeles library because, as you'll see, it had no books in it. <laughs> One never uh, quite uh, comes to understand this, this figure, although, again, there's there's a very clear rationale for it and purpose behind it, but one sees it from the outside of the inside, 
uh, always, always in pieces, and it shows up variously in rooms, sometimes very quietly and sometimes very aggressively. And then there's, on the left, is one of the uh, slightly more aggressive sections. Actually, that's a conference area with one-way glass, and executives sit in that room, apparently, and listen to and watch uh, consumers, and uh, that's why we get what we get. Uh, on the right, <laughs> another uh, abuse of the learning process of psychology. This is, this is the, uh, uh, the library itself, which actually has a storage piece, but essentially for tapes uh, rather than books. We're almost getting there, um, not quite. The, the next uh, tenant is about 20,000 uh, square feet, uh, essentially a graphics company and mostly video graphics that do a lot of work for uh, CBS, uh, so you can blame uh, what you see on these characters. Uh, the space is organized, again, in a, in a somewhat conservative way, at least on one level, with this, with this uh, vaulted or arch system that runs between open work areas on the right with those hyperbolic roofs and closed office areas uh, on the left. And in plan, again, uh, particularly on the right, kind of uh, a mapping diagram of possibilities, not all of which come to fruition, but there is this axis that runs down the center which is in fact not walkable, it's only partially walkable in that on one side. So one has this arch system, but one can't move down the center of it. One can only move on the left-hand side as one goes toward this, the, the top of the slide. Uh, at the end, that sort of triangulated piece is in fact an exercise room, uh, and at the opposite end is a stair uh, which leads up to uh, cor <coughs> corporate offices in the front of the building. So, on the left uh, is a study model of uh, this exercise area. Uh, the rib is always is a constant piece. Uh, it's tapered, as you see. Uh, the web is tapered. Uh, but it occurs and reoccurs, and simultaneously it's always different. It hits walls and stops, it hits walls and goes through. In some cases, supports acrylic pieces that are under skylights. So again, it's both constant and constantly changing. And finally, it twists to become and inverts itself to become part of the uh, stairway system, uh, in, uh, which leads up to the roof of the exercise room. Uh, drawing on the right, uh, the, the section into which the vault uh, was placed uh, in, an, in an effort to, to document how it is both constant and constantly changing. You can see on the right of that slide these hyperbolic pieces, which are generated by a wall line uh, on at at, on the inside of the plan, that is at the edge of the vault, and by a window, a clear story window, uh, at the wall of the space. Uh, on the left, uh, an effort to see uh, the exercise room both from below and from above simultaneously. Uh, the piece on the right is, is the entrance uh, to this space, and on the left, uh, this is actually a window from the second floor which was set up or was supposed to intended uh, for the, the boss uh, to be able to look out and make sure everybody uh, had his or her head down 
but it, it, it was set up in such a way as to make that almost impossible. So he's, he's looking into uh, uh, what I've now started to refer to as the fog of architecture. But he can't, anyway, uh, spy on uh, his people, or he's going to have to work to do it. Anyway, on the right, uh, the frames, uh, as they uh, uh, interconnect uh, with the hyperbolic lid, uh, and on the left, the shot uh, down the center uh, of the space. On the left, uh, this is the exercise room under construction. Uh, there are uh, two columns at, at uh, vertices of, of that triangulated room uh, that are not uh, on the center line uh, of the frame, which is shown uh, up above on the right, uh, which hold these uh, uh, heating and cooling units, uh, which are different sizes, as are the columns, that is to say, uh, different sizes in plan. <coughs> That's uh, the exercise room. And as a, as a, for instance, you can see that acrylic piece, a slide on the left and slide on the right, uh, which uh, occurs under that round skylight as an intervention uh, between people who are working below and direct light coming in uh, from that skylight. And those skylights occur at three points when one moves from other spaces in the project perpendicular to the axis and run and come to the axis and at that point again three times those round skylights occur. On the left uh, the roof of the exercise room and on the right uh, again the exercise room which is in described in a drawing sense axially but is never approached uh, axially. Uh, ceiling of the exercise room on the right and looking from the inside uh, back down the exit. So you can do it from inside, but you can't do it from outside. I don't know what Freud has to say about that. Uh, the, next, the next piece, uh, very quickly, is, is what I've referred to as, as a street corner uh, in the project. It occurs in the midst of a filmmaker's office and really does nothing except conduct uh, people who are working there from one place or one working space in the building uh, to another, essentially running this way uh, and this way through the plan from above and from below uh, on the left. From, from outside on the right and from inside on the left, There are pieces in the space which are set up for exhibits, those steel uh, plates uh, that you see there on the left, in the space looking back uh, to the central walkway and from the central walkway looking uh, forward into the space uh, slide on the right. Are they coming for me or for you? The way this thing works in plan, uh, there are, again, two intersecting geometries, one eight-sided, one circular. And in this case, they cross one another. So that looking at, at the slide on the left, if the condition, and I can't tell from looking at that which is which, but if the condition on the outside is a curve, when it passes through that junction point, which is a kind of conceptually infinity. It's a line or a point. And when it crosses that, it goes from a curve on the outside to a curve on the inside, and eight-sided on the inside to eight-sided on the outside. So the wall of the space is made of the conjunction of those two forms. And then there's also an issue in section, which raises uh, to the center of the space beyond the skylight, which affects some of the soffits. Uh, the last uh, space 
uh, is the conference room, uh, which was set into uh, an old masonry kiln and is uh, elliptical, as are the other two junction points in the project, but conical, uh, although I think in Euclidean terms that's not possible because you can't resolve a cone into a single point, uh, but nonetheless not a problem here because it doesn't resolve anyway. Uh, it's set up, you can see uh, from below on the right, so that the ellipse at the plane of the floor is actually too large for the space so that it intersects the wall and you get, as a consequence, uh, the elevation in the slide on the left. And on the right, looking up uh, into, into the lid of the space, which actually slopes. There's also a table, as you can see, that I designed for the space which is actually made of doors, uh, of wood doors and steel doors, although I, I think at this point one has to look pretty hard uh, to see that, uh, and I think that was part of the intention. The room is actually, in a fundamental sense, in an abstract sense, bilaterally symmetrical, although the, the holes, the roof, uh, and various events at the next level contradict uh, the symmetry of the space. So I think in the end, uh, you're actually left with both. Uh, very quickly, two uh, recent residential uh, projects. Uh, this is a house uh, in West Los Angeles, uh, which the essential piece of which uh, is uh, I guess what has to be called a kitchen, and a kitchen in a programmatic way because these people seem to live their life socially uh, very much around sort of making salad with their friends and talking and all of that. So that that big space, which is, which is in plan actually two circles uh, coming out of two centers, and the first center, in case anyone is interested, is actually physiologically in plan the center uh, of the site. Uh, there was an original scheme that I did, and you can see a trace of it in the drawing on the right, which involved three rectilinear pieces. And there are a number of interesting discussions that occurred with a client who on some occasions wanted an accounting for why certain things were the way they were. And my explanation always had to do with a building that wasn't there. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's been uh, built into the project, at least in subtle ways. Uh, the section, uh, the stretching out of the building, this, this uh, curved roof, actually comes from, from a sort of surgical incision in what is at least in part a cone. And when one cuts through that cone, one gets as a section, when one cuts vertically through the cone, one gets this curved roof, which is then pulled out toward the street. But that, the cone is not completely there nor is the curved roof with the exception of that one instance where it goes uh, from edge to edge. So there's one instance of the completed curve, although in a construction sense that curve is, is understood, at least conceptually, as being made up of three beams, a double flange steel in the center and then wood on either side. And that never occurs completely either but always occurs in, in pieces. Looking uh, on the left uh, in plan, uh, this, this major area at the bottom of the plan, and uh, organizationally this uh, kitchen space on the right uh, and the entry uh, at the right of the slide. Uh, again, there's, there's this interest in, in a kind of analytical mapping, which is uh, shown uh, in the slide on the right, which is a way of accounting for pieces both in the plan uh, and in the section, but not necessarily, again, in a way which is, which is so it's a kind of emotional geometry, if that's, that's possible. It exists in, in a sense in an analytical way, but the experience uh, should be somewhat different than that. 
uh, slide on, on the left, uh, the process actually of supporting the roof and the relationships of the two centers, one which is uh, cut off to some extent on the left, which is the edge of the kitchen, and the other which is actually the center of the property and of the roof, and that black piece is a steel ring uh, running around and uh, supporting that roof, apparently. In section, there are actually three major steel beams that have various adventures as they go through that space. And they land on, there are nine points, uh, intentionally nine and intentionally an odd number, that are structural points that are placed around the perimeter uh, of, of the kitchen. So that lines drawn through the center, these beams included among them, never are lines drawn through the space from one support to another don't pass uh, through the center. And you can see something of, of the, the, the highest beam there, that uh, black uh, piece uh, in the upper part of the slide near the roof. And various uh, sort of escapades. Uh, the one on the left actually is a study of the transition that takes place in, in the building at the point where one moves from the conical piece to the, to the elongated, vaulted section of the roof. And again, this, this mapping, one of uh, the second floor, and I think the other one is of the roof, which shows a whole series of hypothetical possibilities and, and uh, how they're actualized at those two levels. And the model front piece is concrete. Uh, so this is uh, back a few months. So the, the highest steel ring that I referred to in the previous slide on the left is, is uh, there on the right. And then this, this beam uh, system, the double flanges, uh, and then the wood sections which describe if, if they existed uh, in their entirety, the completion of the cut through the cone. And on the left, uh, looking up into the kitchen, uh, and on the right, uh, the concrete wall at the front of the building at the street and its congenial association with its uh, neighbors also. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are English, Jesus. The guy that has the most dexterity at the AA is the guy that works the projection <laughs> system. Common knowledge. Anyway, last project is, is uh, relatively recent. It's not under construction yet. It's, it's a guest house uh, on a site which is already, uh, uh, already has uh, a fairly large scale but otherwise conventional, pedestrian, mundane, or predictable, uh, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, tract house uh, in the San Fernando Valley uh, north of Los Angeles. Again, this, this uh, working out uh, at some level of the process uh, of, of mapping the building on the left. Jesus. On the right is uh, the original house, and you have to guess which is the new, which is the old. Um, so looking from above on the left, the building looks out to an enormous uh, view called the Santa Monica Conservancy, which is supposed to be uh, preserved in perpetuity, and hopefully that doesn't mean uh, 20 minutes, but it's an astonishing uh, experience for someone who, who lives 
uh, in a city like Los Angeles, it's a wooded area and follows off uh, down that slope. And the, the impetus for this, or the original gesture, had to do, and the building had to sit on the edge of this slope, uh, was something that might disappear by rolling away. Uh, so that it began spherically, and then the impetus both to roll away and to do something which prevented the rolling away. And I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but left, there's what is essentially a bleacher system on the roof, uh, which allows uh, people to get up there and, and look out uh, for, uh, for long distances, a very spectacular views. There are three levels to this thing. The lowest level is an apartment, uh, which is shown here. It really is a kind of toy, in a sense. I mean, you can climb all over it and you can get at it. Uh, in various ways from various positions uh, on the floors or on the site. So the lowest level is an apartment. Uh, the middle level is an office level. Actually, they have four employees that are going to work in this thing. Uh, and then the top level is a kind of uh, studio for the owners. I think just for reference, I think it's the machine because uh, it couldn't be the slide <laughs> because we went through this yesterday. And is it? It's always the same machine, huh? Sure. No comment. <laughs> This is probably not the slide I wanted to leave up for 20 minutes, but... This is a pretty regular occurrence around here. 